I'm going to mute myself. Okay. So we are now recording. And it looks like you have one more person coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and go whenever you're ready. All right. Hi, guys. Um, I'm co commonly known as Captain Savage or Lord Ryan Savage on the uh, on Steor's Kingdom Throne Weapons Marshal. Uh, I was asked to do a class on the duties of a Throne Weapons Marshal. Uh, so here we go. Um, one of the first things I thought of when doing this is um, how do we get started? Like, uh, I know whenever I first wanted to do this, it took me seven months to go from I want to do this to actually being able to step up and become the uh, officer for my barony. Uh, and so there's a lot of stuff there that like I didn't know and I kept finding out as I went along. So ever since then, I've been trying to make it a whole lot easier for people that are coming up. Um, first thing I, I usually recommend is download the rules. Um, Marshall.onstiora.org. There's a copy of the rules. We use the, uh, the Kingdom rules on Sierra as anything special. Uh, if you didn't know, it, some kingdoms do have their own specialized rules. Uh, I know that uh, things last year went up to teach some people up in Kalantir out of throw, so I took a copy of the Kalantir rules just to make sure I wasn't teaching them anything that was, you know, illegal where they're from. Uh, what I usually recommend someone does is to read them once all the way through, put them down like a day or two and reread them. Um, the reason for that is because there's just a lot of, it's a lot of distances and stuff like that. You really need to, you need to remember. Um, so I find it easy. It was easiest to kind of read through it and then come back to it. Um, uh, the other thing you can do uh, if say you've got like if you already have a thrown weapons officer in your group uh, you can volunteer to be a deputy uh, basically show up to uh, practice uh, let them know you, you'd like to get involved actually take the initiative to uh, approach them um, that way you can learn how to set up the range and you also learn how to inspect your weapons uh, and also maintain weapons targets stuff like that um, actually kind of what I did when I was stepping up there was not an active practice in my barony we had a whole bunch of equipment but we didn't have anyone actively doing it uh, so luckily the Vizen foyer is real close to Namron so went up to Vizen foyer I volunteered to help on the range learn some stuff read the rules and then finally I tracked down a authorizing marshal which you have to get authorized to become a uh, thrown weapons marshal so uh, that in itself can somewhat be tedious. Um, the marshal.onstore.org website does have a list of authorizing marshals. So uh, if you're interested in getting authorized, I'd start there. Uh, see if your group, your group has anyone local uh, and then see if you can contact them. Um, hopefully either through, you know, um, Facebook or populist meeting, try to make contact. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, if you don't have a local group to go to to learn from, uh, you can send an email uh, to King of Thorn Weapons Marshal, which I should know my my email address, but hold on, not not off the top of my head. Hold on, I'm gonna pull that up and forgot because it is it is my job to try to uh, help. You know get thrown weapons out there. So you can also email me at throne at marshall.onstiora.org. Uh, let me know you're interested in doing this and I'll see if I can put the word out, try to get a marshal to, you know, go to an event possibly and get you authorized. I know I did find out last year that War of the Rams does have a giant authorizing day, um, which is pretty awesome. I helped volunteer uh, to do some authorizations that day. I think we probably did like I want to say somewhere around like seven people we got authorized uh, during War of the Rams, which was pretty awesome. Uh, let's see. So, <clears throat> as far as as far as going through getting authorized and everything, once you've hit that step, uh, if you want to become your local group's uh, thrown weapons officer, um, basically. Uh, if they have an open position, you'll need to go through and actually get the application, which is something I found out like right around that seven month mark that, Hey, there's an application for this. You need to go on and get, 
Uh, and that's actually going to be on the uh, on Steer webpage. Uh, it's going to be under, I want to say forms, and it's a Seneschal form. You'll get that, fill it out, uh, and then you'll need to get it into your, uh, assuming you've got a, assuming it's a barony, uh, being your baron, baroness. Uh, if not, then, you know, Seneschal, at, very, at the very least, and you send it into them. Uh, you do need to send it into the uh, throne at, uh, at it. You need to send it to Kingdom Throne Weapons and Kingdom Missile Marshal uh, at the very very least. Uh, so what what are some of the duties of a local uh, Throne Weapons Marshal for, say, a, a, an officer position? Uh, well, they're going to be setting up practice. Uh, that is going to include setting up the range. Uh, also, hauling out all the targets. Uh, making sure you inspect all the weapons before anyone even gets to touch them. Uh, so generally, uh, at, when I was Namron Stone Weapons Marshal, I'd usually show up an hour before practice. Uh, and this would actually give me enough time to drag everything out of the shed, take it across the field, uh, get it set up. Because uh, to be honest, setting up the range is, is, especially by yourself, is a good 30 minute task. Uh, if you're setting up, you know, three to three to four lanes, uh, it is going to take a little while for you to actually set up the stand the target and then also measure your safety distance. Um, so just make sure you get there ahead of time. Uh, it is awesome if you have deputies because yeah, they can help you carry stuff. Um, so uh, some of the other things that come with uh, being a local marshal though is the actual getting waiver signed. Uh, one of the things when I was uh, and Marshall, we would actually have the waiver set out and would, we would we would have them sign it whether they had a blue card or not. And honestly, that, that kind of helped us track our numbers because uh, Thorn Weapons actually doesn't have any regional officers. We just don't have the uh, or regional marshals rather. They still have the numbers to support that. Uh, so that was sort of a way to uh, track attendance, to see uh, so many people were actually showing up. Um, but get your waiver, make sure you've got the current, most current waiver. Uh, whenever you, at the end of practice, uh, the best, one of the best practices to do with that is to actually um, take a photo of it with your uh, phone, uh, convert it to a PDF. The, the thing I actually use is Cam Scanner. I'm sure there's plenty of other apps out there, but that was one of the ones I was introduced to a long time ago. Uh, it's pretty easy. You just, you pull off the program, you get it, you get your waiver lined up, snap a picture, uh, you can then attach it to an email and you send it to your Seneschal and to the waiver secretary, uh, which is not something they necessarily tell you when you first get authorized. Uh, I didn't find out about that until later. It's like, have you been sending your waivers in? I'm like, yeah, have you been sending them to the waiver secretary? No, I didn't know about that. Um, so you're going to want to make sure you do both. Uh, they, they both need to have them because it is Seneschal's job to make sure that you're reporting. Um, uh, as far as being a marshal, you can be a, a group marshal, uh, which I've done. Uh, you can also be an at-large marshal, which basically means you have an authorization to, to run a range, uh, but you're not necessarily attached to the barony office. Um, you can also be a marshal at an event. Uh, it's something called a marshal in charge. Uh, and basically, you're, you're the, the guy that is, or the, you're the person that is setting up the range uh, it's also a smart idea to get yourself some uh, some other marshals to help you run the range, because uh, I generally have I generally recommend having at least two other people to help you. That way, you've got one person on the spear lane. Because whenever you're, you you go to an event, what I have found is you usually have a whole lot of people that have never thrown weapons before, and they need to be trained um, to do it safely, and this takes some time. Uh, now, when you're doing the axe and the knife portion of it, the mechanics of that's a lot of, uh, is is mostly the same as far as the throw. But the spear, spear throw is completely different. So I like to have one person on the end with the knife and the axe, and then one person uh, on the opposite end with the spear. That way, they can show them how to throw it properly. Uh, and then the third person, uh, I would I would have them keep score because. Uh, usually at an event, you're low on sleep and there's a whole lot of stuff going on and it is really hard to keep track of the score 
and the range at the same time. So I've done a lot of, I've done a lot of events where I was marshal in charge or an assisting marshal. And that is what I found best. Um, so one of the things I learned from Monty is, is when you're setting up your range, it is smart to have a um, knife, axe, and spear lane, and you just keep rotating people through. Uh, and also that's how he, he liked to train new marshals as well as to do a mock tournament uh, using that same setup. Um, so when I, when I first, when I first stepped up as a marshal, I, uh, I think it was like a month or two into it. I'd never, not even hold, held a practice. Um, but I got asked to go to be a marshal in charge because we had equipment. And so I think, I think that one tournament, I, I think I ran it for like three and a half hours and people were just like done. Um, so, um, paperwork, depend, um, whenever you run an event, you do need to make sure that you do an event report, uh, and you've got 30 days to do that though, because I'm very forgetful. Um, I try to make sure I do it the same day. Uh, you go on the web, basically marshall at onstory.org. There's a report for events and it's going to have like a, <clears throat> <clears throat> it's going to have a summary of what you did. I believe it should also ask for any authorizing marshals as well. They're not authorizing. Any uh, marshals that you had assisting you. Uh, and just a basic breakdown. Um, I think I forgot to go over some more stuff on the local group marshal stuff. Um, so as, as the uh, there's a group marshal, uh, one of the things you may have to do too is not only maintain equipment, like if you have axes with wooden handles, um, periodically those break and you need to replace them. Um, you also, your targets will also break and you'll need to replace them. Uh, one of the things that I did in order to try to be more budget friendly is we started off with uh, log rounds, which is basically just a tree that has been cut. Um, and you probably want, you don't want a small target. You want to, the bigger the target you can get, the better, only because it gives them more space to uh, throw their weapons. Um, so that, that's one of the things is, is you'll find is that there's a lot of different schools of thought on that. Um, there's a lot of different styles of targets. And sometimes that can be overwhelming if you're just starting out. Um, and that's why I, I finally landed on the log targets just because it was more friendly for our budget. Uh, as I made the stands out of two by fours, um, and I used, we basically, um, modified a plan that I found for a portable target. Um, one of my deputies, I actually figured out how to convert it over to American, um, standards because I think it was in like British measurements, which a two by four in Britain is different than America. We found out, um, and so that, that we, we did that and we've, we've, that's actually lasted uh, I did my full two years, and now we're on, it, I think they're on, like, year three of their life. Or, or actually, they might be on year two of their life. But you, periodically, you'll need to replace the uh, little shelf that holds the target up. But other than that, um, and if, if you need help, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what kind of weapons you can get if they're budget-friendly, um, what kind of stands. If you put out, you know, a call for information on any of the thrown weapons groups, you're, you're going to get a lot of different stuff. Like I said, there's a lot of schools of thought that go into this. Um, and it's very, and if you need, I mean, feel free to email me. I'll, I'll tell you what I've tried. Uh, I had a budget to work in. I, I know when Amron had a, probably a better budget than uh, a, a, at least a group north of us. I know because I've, I've talked to that uh, uh, Marshall. I helped, I helped get him authorized back in the day. Um, Did anybody have any questions so far um, about anything we've gone over? No, I saw something pop up in the chat, but I didn't actually look at it. Do you have access to the chat? I do, I just pulled it up. Okay, great. Yeah, I talked a lot faster in real life than I had in my head. That's so I thought, I thought I'd be uh, 
it wouldn't, it wouldn't be as far right now. You're fine. But that's pretty cool. I've actually never got to throw at Gulf Wars because uh, back when I went, I wasn't quite in uh, into throwing yet. Yeah, we definitely need to put um, something out on the groups about, you know, if people have free time to go and help volunteer. Right. Um, I, I know I do that for Siege, too. Oh, thing I did forget to mention, um, as far as being a local uh, marshal for your group, uh, it is important to take notes. Because uh, when it comes time to do your report, uh, if you don't have any notes, it, it becomes very, uh, very hard for you to try to remember. <laughs> um, so what I would recommend you do, uh, if you become the local, you'll actually have access to uh, an email account. Uh, and all of the SCA office email accounts actually are run through Google, so they have Google Drive. Uh, what I would actually do is I would save, um, I'd do like a Google Doc, and I would put the day of each practice, because it was always on a Sunday. So I'd just look up the calendar for three months, and I'd put the date, uh, and then I'd scribble some notes, like uh, eight participants, two new newcomers, um, you know, maybe one youth, uh, something like that. So whenever it comes time to do your report, all you really got to do is copy and paste it into the form. And then send it off to the Kingdom of Thunder Weapons Marshal, which now I've got to see both sides of that. Well, from the Marshal side and the the, the local Marshal side and the Thrown Weapon Kingdom Thrown Weapon side, um, which unfortunately with uh, COVID there wasn't a whole lot to report on. So, um, but yeah, take notes. Be aware of when your reports to do. Uh, as a local, your reports to do the last day of February. May, August, and November. Um, I suppose if you're at an at-large um, marshal and you have the necessary components to run a to run a practice for your for a local group, uh, then also make sure you take your notes and put in a, a report so that we can see where thrown weapons is happening. I have a question. So if you were uh, at large, um, would you still need a, an officer to be there and won't go to be an official practice? Yeah, you'd still need, as far as I understand it, you still need an officer uh, present in order for it to be counted as a... Which, um, I'm actually still a deputy for the thrown weapons in Namron. And part of the reason I did that originally uh, was so that if, say, I went to the Canton, Cantons, uh, I'd still be able to run an official practice since I was a deputy, which counts as the, the marshal position, so he'd be an officer. Now, if you are the, um, like like he's saying, if you are a deputy or if you are the marshal, you don't actually have to have another officer there because you are the officer. Right. I knew that if you were the officer, I didn't realize deputy counted, so that's good to know. Yeah, that's that's also why I made sure that the deputies I took on were also authorized before I made them deputies. Um, and in fact, in order to do that, I, I kind of stocked Romanius for a while. I knew where he, which event he's going to show up, so I could get them authorized. So. How does Onciora handle youth at archery practice or or thrown weapons practice? Um, do you have to have someone with a with the background check there or or not? That is a good question because I haven't actually had that happen. I haven't had a youth practice with uh, since the new laws and rules have come out. Uh, okay. In the, past, the way I've that actually works. Parent. Go ahead, Carl. The, the way that actually works right now, or at least when I was king of missile marshal is it is okay if you are do not have a background check as long as the parent is there. I mean, the kid just can't show up, ah, la, la, here I am. You know, no, i got to have a parent there. And um, with all things, if you don't have a background check, if the kid is doing something and you need to adjust their stance, you ask them and their parent if it is okay to actually touch them to help uh, 
to adjust their their stance or their throw or something like that. Um, common sense rule applies. Um, do not have uh, kids there without their parents, unless you um, actually have a background check. Yeah, and I usually just try to show them the difference between their stance and mine rather than touching them, just to be extra careful. <laughs> but that's right. just me. I say, yeah, in the past, a lot of times, if uh, well, I'll just ask, it's like, are you are you 18? If not, it's like, okay, we need your we need your parent or you know legal guardian or whatever it is you you've got at the event uh, to come down here so we can make sure you're okay to do this. Uh, and I'll, I'll say a lot of times too, we would have a waiver ready um, just in case they didn't have their um, site token on them. Because if they had their site token on them, that would at least indicate that they'd been through gate and had signed the waiver. Um, and if they couldn't prove that, then we'd go ahead and get a, we'd have a waiver ready to go. Because I just wanted to make sure that we had everything covered. Um, I suppose I could talk a little bit about like authorizing marshals, like whenever I, I do it, um, I, I do encourage them to be a little bit sassy if they have to, uh, and just in order to make sure the rules enforced, because as, as a thrown weapons marshal, you're, you're the safety, you're the guy, safety person in charge of that range. Um, you don't want any injuries to happen. Um, there's a lot of, like a lot that can go wrong. So it's you, you need to be on top of it. Uh, and that's why I've told people, I'm like, look, if you got to be sassy to make sure that they listen to you, you go right ahead. Uh, be as sassy as you need to be. Uh, and if they can't follow the rules, then you get to, you can ask them to leave a range. Um, I've only, I only had to put one person in timeout at a practice uh, once, uh, and I got the point across. Um, but, uh, as far as like, yeah, any other learning, it's it. It's honestly that the more you do it, uh, the better at it you're going to get. There's just a lot of stuff to remember, and the more the more times you do it, the better. So it is. It's great to be able to actually go and do a mock practice, a mock tourney with this. That way you you're getting a first hand experience, and that's that's what I learned from Amanius, and that's actually what I've continued doing uh, whenever authorizing new people. I think, I think just being able to go through it multiple times uh, and even I, I, I even will uh, act and uh, I will misbehave to see if they catch it. Like, you know, put my foot over the line, do, do things like possibly stand back too far and then see if they actually catch it. So I'm mischievous that way in training. And he brings people to be mischievous too. It's true. <laughs> but that's good i needed to learn and i did there's just a lot of scenarios that can happen on the range that you got to look out for um one of the ones that um you may not notice is that someone's sitting there fidgeting with their their knife or their axe or whatever and they've got their arm up and they're they're practicing before you even call ready um so that that's something too you got to keep a lookout for um and you'll have that happen a lot at tournaments, I've noticed. Because, uh, as I mentioned, every, every time we do a tournament, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we probably get like 20 to 30 people that have not thrown before that are interested in throwing. And they may not all show up back up for the tournament, um, but they'll definitely show up beforehand wanting to practice. And so uh, as a result of that, we've been trying to, if we can, get an extra hour in front of the tournament just for practice. Uh, because it's crazy how many people actually show up want to do that. And a lot of times I'll try to ask them, you know, what, what group you're from and try to try to ask them if they actually have a thrown weapons um, program going already. But uh, I've, I've found out that we don't have many marshals out there actively doing it in the kingdom. So um, hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully they'll go back and ask for something. But um, yeah, when you got a lot of new throwers there, there's, I've noticed a lot of things like fidgeting with their knife. Um, also, they will throw, they will throw at the target like it's a baseball, and and that can get real dangerous because we've got a ten foot safety distance for uh, knives and axes uh, for a reason because it will bounce back. 
And so, you know, if they hit wrong and they bounce back, then it can be bad. So you, you need to, you know, look out for that. Try to correct it if they're, they're throwing, if you can. Um, but generally, if they haven't thrown before and they're just tossing it like it's a baseball, like a fast pitch, um, there's not a whole lot you can do. Just, you know, don't give them – Maybe don't give them metal axes because metal axes bounce worse than uh, wood handles. Hey, Captain, have you ever had anything happen like, um, so there was an event that I went to uh, and I was helping with water bearing and I happened to be going over to archery to give them water. And they said, so Kat, there's no target archery marshal here because the guy running the tournament that had won the year before was not a marshal. So I ended up stopping with water bearing and staying there to help marshal the range. So they actually had a marshal. Have you ever heard of anything like that happening with thrown weapons? Uh, I have had something similar where like a week with like less than a week advance notice. They're like, Hey, we don't have a marshal. Can you come do it? I'm like, well, I hadn't planned on it, but I guess I can do that. Um, we've actually there's been groups too that don't have their own thrown weapons gear. So we've had to tote the Namron stuff around quite a bit. Um, I can't, I don't even know how many different events we've had to take it to, but had very similar stuff happen where it's like they had the event plan, but they didn't have anybody in place to supply the stuff or to marshal it. Yeah. That's probably something that needs to be added. I have like a autocratting method um, thing and you know, that's a lot of times it's you have your knights marshal or your archery marshal or whoever it is for the group but uh, other times they're like oh well the champion's gonna run that well you can't guarantee that the champion is an authorized marshal and you need to make sure and if they're not then they need to make plans for that actually that has happened a bit too where they were just planning on the champion to run it um actually i think i rolled up to uh i think it was eldern uh, like two years ago, Skeggy, I believe, was the champion. And um, I think he asked us, so, hey, can you guys come do this thing? I'm like, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, it was at Eldern that I got asked <laughs> to do the archery, too. They had someone there that was a marshal, but he ended up having plans to do two things at the same time in different parts of site and just left without having someone else there to cover so we're lucky nothing bad happened uh, i've had that happen more from my herald side voice herald side of things i uh, roll up to an event and they're like hey we don't have a herald you're a herald don't you go do the thing oh so that happens a lot don't get ivo started on that <laughs> so I, I know at least on the the heraldry side of things they they've told us because i was the uh namron herald for a little bit um they told us that we need to, you know, remind them to make sure they have a um, site herald and a, like, a, if they have any um, Cheval going on, also to get a uh, herald for that as well. Have two different people doing those. That's a whole, that's a whole different skill set. Mm -hmm. uh, Muriel, have you experienced that happening at Gulf War? <laughs> um, actually, I haven't. Gulf War handles things a little bit differently. The majority of the marshals there, like Glenavon marshals, actually authorize in both thrown weapons and live weapons. And the way that the rules are written, you have to have a marshal for every tournament. So even if the champion is going to run it, there still has to be a marshal there. Mm -hmm. um, so we really haven't run into that a lot. That's why I was asking, what year did that happen at Gulf War? Because if that happened, it was it was really weird. No, um, not at war. <laughs> not okay. at war. What was that okay. again? I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, we were talking about having tournaments happen, and I was asking Captain if it's ever happened to him, where the you know, past year's champion was running it, but then they hadn't arranged to have a marshal there. Mm -hmm. That happened to me with archery at Eldern, where I was so helping water bear. I know, yeah, it's crazy. It's totally crazy. Uh, it used to happen a lot, which is why, um, as a, uh, I know that right now in Northkeep, we have a stepping down missile marshal, and we don't have, or the person that's stepping up is not an authorized marshal yet. Mm. Um, 
They're also going to be the thrown weapons marshal because North Keep does not have a large throwing community. We would like to have one. So we're uh, combining the two offices into one. Um, thus the need for portable targets. Uh, the target I have uh, different, we need to have, um, do we have some kind of site out, out there or something? We need to have maybe on the Vindheim site or something, uh, have multiple um, designs. Uh, I know that your design, um, uh, Cap Savage, and your design, Lorenzo, are much different from mine and much different from each other. Uh, the frames are all different. Uh, the styles are all different. Mine is yep. probably the portable, most portable and lightest of the three, but it doesn't necessarily make it the best. Yeah, I, I agree. I'd like to see some, especially since we're uh, social distancing right now, trying to get people, if they have space to do it safely, like give them plans for stuff to do it at home. That'd be, uh, that would be something I'd like to see. Mine probably requires uh, just as many tools because it requires a, well, um, I'm actually going to do a modification of what you guys have. Uh, I'm not doing the logs because in, unless you actually know people, the logs are really hard to get. Um, yeah. uh, the, the style that Lorenzo has uh, with, the, with the blocks, uh, that, I think that's originally a Romania's design. Uh, is actually pretty easy to make with a two by fours, but instead of gluing the blocks in, um, what might be an easier way to uh, would be to put leather on the front where the where the frame is, and have a plywood back, and yeah. have holes holes drilled in it, and actually uh, screw the frigging uh, blocks down with uh, short uh, one inch screws or something like that through the plywood. Screw them in so. If the block gets all trashed out, you just unscrew that block, pull it out, put a new one in. Modular. Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I've been trying. It's um, His is based on one that I built. It's a, an ingrain target that I found. And, yeah, I glued the rows together mm -hmm. uh, in hopes that I'd be able to replace it uh, if it broke. So I've been testing it to see if I can get it to break and how easy it's going to be to fix it. Um, but, yeah, just – that would be interesting if you could get it tightened down. And I assume the leather you're talking about would be to keep it wedged in. Uh, no, the leather would actually be for the front of the frickin' frame. So you, somebody throws it, doesn't splinter your damn frame with the first shot. Uh, um, okay. So it would be to protect the leather, actually. Uh, but if you screw those blocks in, I mean, uh, was that 30, uh, 32 blocks in that thing or something like that? Uh, 25. Yeah, they're, the rows are, screw, are glued together, and then the backs are screwed into the, uh, the back of it. Uh, to just keep them from wiggling out. Because I this is actually the second version of this I made. The first one I made with uh, two by fours and the axes just chewed them up. Uh, yeah. At least um, they, with the four by fours, they're standing up to the axes for, for now. Yeah. My my portable one that I use right now is a four by four that I basically chopped into four pieces. And it's, I tried gluing them together. That didn't work so well. Um, so what I did was I drilled a hole through the entire set as well as the one by fours on the side drilled through the entire thing and took two pieces of um, uh, thread rod, just drove it, drove it through the whole damn thing, drilled the hole, drove it through, and then just put uh, uh, nuts on each side and just clamped the crap out of it. I mean, screwed it down to really tight. Unfortunately, um, after a few times, I've noticed that one of my axes actually went all the way in, or not my axe, my kukri, actually went yeah. all the way in and hit the... Uh, the threaded rod and actually nick the end a little bit so yeah, yeah i'm done with that i have uh, screwing uh screws into the back so i didn't screw screws uh, through all the logs in the back of line it's mostly glued and then yeah. maybe three or four screws in the back holding the uh logs to the uh to the plywood um because i was worried that if the axe ever beat away at the wood that it it might hit one of the screws and nick it. That's fair. Ooh. I used, uh, I want to say I used two and a half inch screws. And so there's, it's not sticking through as far as it could. But yeah, if it ever breaks to that point where it could actually get to the screw, it would be definitely one I would replace it. Uh, I, I have seen. Don't think they this. Actually... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I, I have, think the screws really need to be that long. Yeah, um, I think, I don't remember how thick the back of it is. Uh, 
half inch or something like that online. Yeah. Yeah, those blocks actually stick out how far um, in front? They're uh, they're as tall, they're as wide as a two by four. So I think it's uh, three and a half inches. This is how long they are. Okay. Because I think if you actually um, had that penetrate an inch and a half, I think um, you're not really going to be using a whole lot of force to actually hold that in because most people don't pull straight up, pull their axe knife. They push it down to, to uh, kind of pop the tip. Right. So I don't think um, we could probably go with uh, shorter screws and that might actually make things a little bit easier and it might let, make them last a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah, my, my hope is, is if these work out to try to implement them for like some sort of Royal Rounds target. Um, that's yeah. something I've been working on for a while. <clears throat> and I've seen the uh, Inter-Kingdom Throne Weapons uh, stuff. And I kind of wanted to make like a better target, so to say, one that was uh, a little bit easier to understand how you build. And like with this one, it's... 25 blocks in a frame and a back. So I was like, we'll try this. Uh, if need be, I might I might go to a two by six on the frame and make them, make them deeper. But I didn't think I needed to do that starting off. So that's kind of how I settled on this one. About how heavy is that frame with the wood blocks in? It's not that heavy. It's actually, we made, we made a different style that was the, side grain instead of the end grain and it's a lot it's a lot less heavy than that one um it's probably about 30 pounds or something maybe 40 30 maybe 30 pounds 20 30 pounds yeah, so it's too heavy for a pvc frame uh yeah and right now I've got it on my, my portable stand um, and it's actually a lot thinner than a lot of the other ones, a lot of other targets I've thrown at it so the arms are getting in the way. Uh, so we're having to like throw around them. Uh, the, the fix to that of course would just be make shorter arms but I haven't had uh, enough time to go mess with that unfortunately. Um, another thing, another thought that I had is it's actually difficult for people to um, you know, the frame is one thing, or the, uh, but the stand, the stand is, is, those are big and bulky. And if you don't have a truck, you're kind of screwed. Um, uh, what I was thinking of is there's another, another way you could possibly go. And that would be, uh, you know, the big metal, um, fence posts, the, you know, the ones that, are, um, they're T-shaped. Okay. Um, if you could actually drive those down in the ground, uh, get the six, the, the six footers or even the four footers, drive them down and actually on the frame have a side block that kind of acts like a little um, ledge or something like that. Have some holes drilled in the frame, lower down and actually zip tie it to the thing. Or, I mean, it's a thought. You're going to have to probably put some foam around those fence posts because I did, I guarantee I'm going to get one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say that the current stand design is definitely a lot smaller and a lot less heavy than the original one I had. Uh, I originally uh, copied uh, the one that Fusion Foyer had, which was basically two by sixes. Uh, and it was like a two six foot legs and an eight foot um, back part. So it's like eight feet sticking out. So you definitely needed a truck for that one. Um, at least with these, yeah. they're, they're about five feet. Uh, I don't remember the exact measurement, but it's slightly, I want to say it's slightly under five feet. And so it actually will fit in, the, in my Jeep. Um, but yeah, I, having a portable stand for like taking to tournaments and stuff is definitely important. Yeah. And I think that the stand is probably about the same weight as the target is. Um. The other thing I was thinking is, uh, I don't know if you've seen my stands. Uh, what I do is, well, I told you basically, um, but if, if you do the frame, if you just attach, attach the legs to the frame or something like that, uh, uh, they're one by fours and it's basically a scissor leg. Um, it's just got two in the front, two in the back. 
Okay. Uh, there's a way to um, like like leather or something like that to put on the front of them because um, I remember I had some PVC um, archery target uh, legs and stuff like that, and I went out there and the first thing I said is like, okay, avoid the PVC. The first thing I will hit the damn thing and broke it. Yeah. Like, like, really. So. Um, yeah, portable stands would be really nice, uh, especially for tournaments. I mean, you can just show up in your stand. Here we go, you know. I like that a lot. Yeah, we've uh, we've hauled the because we we made a uh, we made a prototype set first, and then we made the the ones for the the barony. Um, and these these have held held up. The legs have taken some axes. The shelves that the target set on is taking some axes, but they're still going. Um, and we, the way we did it, we still had some. We have some spare wood, basically, to replace the shelf. They have surprisingly held up for a while. That's cool. Yeah, I when I had. Sorry. No, I was just going to ask a question. With uh, making the targets with the side grain versus the end grain, how uh, have you noticed a difference in the way knives or axes are sticking? Have you had more bounce back, or are they sticking just as well as if it were end grain? So, me personally, uh, the reason I made the end grain is because my side grain was not taking my axes. Uh, it was rather frustrating. The only ones that would stick were the, uh, the metal ones, the MTEX. Um, they would stick because they will stick in anything. Um, the Norse hawks that I have, they're cold steel. They're um, they're sticking in the end grain awesomely. The side grain, I like. I was sharpening them, trying to get them to stick. Just couldn't do it. It's yeah. It's in, uh, side grains. It's difficult to get things to stick. So I was just wondering what the uh, so side grain is good for knife targets. So um, if say you already had one and you wanted to use it for the knife lane. Go right ahead. Uh, I've actually also stuck spears in it. Uh, it was awesome for taking the spear as well. Uh, in fact, the uh, the side grain that we have is actually based off of one of the Romanius style targets where he actually built a frame and the target together. We just built the top of the frame because we already had a stand. Um, okay. Things pretty hefty, but yeah, it'll it, it'll take a spear. You can act as a hard, um, hard target for your spear, no problem. All right, thanks. Oh. Did anybody have any other questions? Nope, I'm just washing my hands, getting ready to eat. <laughs> because I wash my damn hands. I'm <laughs> proud of you. Good job, Carl. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Captain, so much for teaching. I really appreciate it. You did a great job. Thank you. And yeah. Thanks, everybody yes, else, for well. contributing, to, you know, thoughts and questions and ideas and all that good stuff. Yes, I will uh, get the video posted either later tonight or tomorrow. Awesome. And All we'll right. talk, Kat, about how we can do uh, Thursday night. Yeah, definitely. I'll test that out here in just a little bit, and I'll give you a holler. So, um, If you can't, maybe I can get uh, Johanna to host it. We'll see if she's going to be around. Okay. Yep. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank Bye, you guys. guys. Thank you. Talk to you Thank later. You Bye. Bye.